Good morning. I'd like to call this meeting to order for joining us during our weekly hybrid MLS breakfast meetings. My name is Jolene Chu from Remax My Home, and I am your March program chair. We have portals today, so it's very exciting. If anybody hasn't gotten any, it's available for you. It's very yummy. Uh, but I'd like to start the meeting with um, Gus um, Enrique. Is Gus here with our uh, Pledge of Allegiance? So if everybody may stand. Morning. And place your right hand over your heart. Thank you. And repeat with me. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which stands one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Play ball. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. And next, we'll have our inspirational quote from Teresa Lam, a Concordian title. Thank you, Jolene. Hi, I'm Teresa Lam, and today's um, word of wisdom is from Aristotle. Knowing yourself is the beginning of wisdom, period. <laughs> Something to think about. Thank you so much, Teresa. And again, I'm Jolene too. Um, a little bit about my background, um, if you weren't here last week. <laughs> Hi again. Um, uh, I am currently a broker at Remax My Home in Temple City. Uh, but what felt like very long time ago, I actually started my career as a corporate lawyer. Um, as one of my earlier legal jobs, I was asked to work for an American law firm at their satellite office in Shanghai. I thought I was going to be in Shanghai for about a year when I took on the job but I ended up staying for six years straight in Shanghai. Um, I love the experience. I love the food, the endless karaoke nights and foot massages for anybody else who's been <laughs> to Shanghai. It is awesome. The Bund is um, the place I recommend to hang out. It's very beautiful. Um, and finally, when I moved back to the States, I purchased a new home and that's when I fell in love with real estate. Um, as much as I love the legal experience, um, I feel like real estate is really my passion. When someone asks if I like to show them a home, I can't wait. Um, I'm always more excited than the buyers. Um, so I went full time into real estate. I never looked back. Uh, today, I work with my agents, such as Jeffrey, who is here, and Shen Zhang, um, who's very active with the board. And um, I hope to share the same enthusiasm for my love of real estate with other talented agents. And um, again, I wanted to thank everybody um, here for allowing me to be your March chair. Thank you. And next, um, a few housekeeping tips. All participants will be muted upon entry to the MLS breakfast meeting. And should you have a question or a comment, please remember to enter it into the chat box. Please remember to join us weekly as we have our hybrid MLS breakfast meetings every Thursday at 9 a.m. As always, this meeting is being recorded and will be available online on our YouTube channel, West Liberal Valley Realtors. Please remember to follow. WSGVR social media on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also watch our pre recorded videos on YouTube. Join our text message group for updated text uh, WSGVR to the number 888 301 2201. And all this information can also be seen on um, our slide. Today's agenda consists of our affiliate spotlight, Jeanette Lowe of ACG Funding and our Belma Dinovarich Chinchoy Esquire. Just a reminder that to be eligible for today's drawings, you must be a WSGVR member and be present in person at the association. We will be having an attendance drawing, Amazon gift card drawing, and 50-50 raffle. Today, our affiliate spotlight will be brought to you by the affiliate committee Chair Lena Sankri of U.S. Bank and Vice Chair Teresa Nguyen of Loan Direct. Please remember to support our affiliates with their transactions. Take it away, Janet. My name is Janet. I'll just make it real quick. Um, how many of you know that I work for ACG Funding now? Yay! I was born and raised in Vietnam, for those of you that don't know how <laughs> where I came from. So I have some picture that I want to share with you. You see that little girl? How many of you have a baby picture that with clothes on? <laughs> That's me. And 
that's my parent on the um, from my end. It's right hand corner. That's my parent, and the other one is my grandparent, my mom, my grandmother, and I. The reason why we have this picture because when you are little, you need to get a passport. Your parent or grandparent have to be in the picture with you, so that's why <laughs> I have that picture, and the rest of them. I was born and raised by my family that um, loved to travel. So those are the travel picture. Can you tell the little picture on the other end that opened up my mouth because it's so hot. The ground is so hot. That's why one of my legs get up. The bottom one is, um, is the yacht cup by my house. Um, my grandma, 50th birthday, how many? How many of you think that 50 years old is old? But at that time, 50 year old is old. So that's my, <laughs> that's my grandparent and my dad and mom. The corner picture is in Kamau. Um, you know where it is? Yeah, that's, that's Kamau. So from the north to the south of Vietnam, we travel a lot. The bottom one is, um, you know, after 68, the end of the, for those of you want to know more about me, ask me to your, <laughs> uh, join the open house with you. Then we can talk about. <laughs> Thank you, Janet. We will now have our affiliate introductions for today. All affiliates present today, please line up at the front. Please no promotions. This is a morning greeting only. We will begin with affiliates in person. Man, that's like half the room right there. All right. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> this is Brandon Sobranski with First American NHD. Have a fantastic day. Morning, everyone. This is Karen from General Mortgage Capital Corporation. Have a wonderful day. Good morning. Um, happy Thursday. Do you guys see the beautiful view on the mountain with all the snow? It's so beautiful. Uh, my name is Angie from Long Direct. I am Sek and Angie. Her name is Angie and I I am Angie too. I come from ACG funding. Good morning. This is Alex, your function master. Thank you. Good luck. Good morning. This is Annie Fan, Chicago Title. Have an amazing day. Good morning, everybody. Oriana Chan with Prime Lending. Good morning, everyone. My name is Phoebe Liu from Uses Bank. I'm local commercial as a home loan officer. Thank you. Good morning, Bob Chu with Champion Escrow. Good morning, everybody. Lucia Tam representing CARPA, Chinese American Real Estate Professionals Association. And rain again, stay dry. <laughs> Good morning, Nancy Chan, lawyer's title. Have a wonderful day. Good morning, everybody. My name is James, your good neighbor State Farm agent in the city of Walnut. Uh, stop by in Walnut. We have, we're giving away umbrellas, so come by. <laughs> good morning, everyone. This is Esther Chow with HSBC Bank. Thank you. Good morning. Ed Higuchi with New York Live. Food for thought. If you couldn't give a child in your life one gift for the future, what would that be? The answer is out there on the table out there. Thank you. Good morning, Alina Chu from Glen Oaks Espro. I'm still enjoying the breakfast from today. Yes, good morning. We enjoy portals, right? Thank you. Um, Lina St. Carey from US Bank Home Mortgage. Good morning, I'm Randy Scarra with US Home Home Mortgage. Janet Lowe, I am one of the three sisters, Clara, Oriana, and I. And I'm the oldest, so I admit it. So <laughs> have a good day. Good morning, I'm Teresa Lamb with Corinthian Title Company. For those who did not show up here, you are missing the greatest pastry ever, delicious from Porto. We have spinach pastry and cream puff today. Do you get paid for this thing? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, good morning, David Tran with Home Girl Home Warranty. Uh, glad to be back to help you to become wealthy. So uh, please buy a ticket for me, thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's Derek Talbert from CST Insurance. You guys have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Um, next, we will call on our affiliates who are with us virtually. 
We have John Wax from Snap NHG. Good morning, everyone. I'm tasting the uh, breakfast through the uh, internet here. John Wax with Snap NHD Natural Hazard Disclosures. Have a wonderful caravan meeting and a wonderful week. And we have Sage Gomez from My NHD. Good morning, everyone. Sage Gomez with My NHD. If any of you want to deliver the pastries to me, um, <laughs> I'm more than open to it. Have a great day. And we have Judy Chow from AAA Capital Investments. Good morning, Judy Chow, senior loan officer with AAA. Uh, have a great week. And remember to spring forward one hour this Sunday. Thank you. Sandy Franco from First American Home Warranty. And uh, Unita Wu from Home Warranty of America. Good morning, everyone. Unita Wu from Home Warranty of America, the 13 months home warranty. Um, lots of rain, and we do cover the roof leak repair. If you guys need any home warranty, please reach out to us. Thank you. Angie Tang from First American Title. Good morning, caravanners. Angie Tang, First American. Sorry I'm missing the affiliate party with Portos. I'll be there next week. Hopefully there's Portos again. And if since it's going to be raining again, another storm, we've got First American Umbrella. So if anybody needs any, please let me know. Reach out to me. Angie Tang, First American. Have a great day. And I think it's uh, Guliana Lomajlo. U Union Station Homeless Services. I hope I said that name right. She's not here. Okay. Okay. So next, thank you, everybody. Um, oh, one more. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Cosmo Sanchez, New AIM Funding Lender. I want to invite you guys to a YPN event that we're going to have by the end of this month. It's going to be an 80 themes party. So dress up as your favorite 80 theme character. 80, 80s, 80s theme. So a ticket is $15. And that is going to include a drink and finger foods. So we hope to see you guys there. It's going to be on the 23rd of March at, at our arcade, um, Arcadia, what's it called? Arcadia in what city? Yeah, it's, it's in, um, okay, we're going to send you guys out an email. Okay, so take your email. <laughs> but I just want to make sure you guys mark your calendar. Watch okay, out for you. the email. Okay. We're happy to include open pitches to our hybrid MLS breakfast meeting. Remember, if you would like to pitch your listing, you must go to the www.wsgvr.com, click on open pitch, fill out the caravan request form, and submit it no later than Tuesday midnight of the week you want to pitch. Do we have any today? Today, we do not have any listings. Um, now we would like to welcome our speaker, Balma Dinovich Chinchoy. Good morning, everyone. See, I typically don't need a mic because everyone tells me I am too loud in general, but um, I will stand here and try not to yell at you. Um, let me begin by saying happy belated International Women's Day. Um, I know in, in this country, it's not to all the ladies here, really. Um, I grew up celebrating it and it, I hold it at such a um, dear part of my youth and in this group I feel like it's appropriate we have such a wonderful international crowd here. Um, thank you for inviting me to be here for welcoming me to your association I think it's really a, a wonderful opportunity to have these in sessions informative sessions and it's a wonderful thing that your association does and uh, I also wanted to give a quick shout out to Rosa Santibanes, who I know is joining us virtually for inviting me to be here with you today. My name is uh, Belma Demirovich Chinchoy. I am an immigration attorney. My practice focuses on business immigration. And what that means is that my firm works with two types of clients, really companies and individuals that are entrepreneurs or investors. Um, with companies, we work both with US-based companies who are looking to hire foreign talent and also with foreign-based companies that are looking to set up um, an operation in the US. And as part of that process, they need to bring over to staff from abroad or you know, transfer employees and things like that. When it comes to individuals, um, high net worth individuals who are looking to invest in the United States, 
And as part of that investment, they want to realize an immigration benefit or they are individuals that are looking to set up businesses and run their businesses here in the US and also realize an immigration benefit as part of that process. Um, the back of my business card, I don't know if you guys do that, but it's definitely one of my favorite um, topics when it comes to networking events. Um, the back of my business card set currently says um, a dancer, a mom, um, a lover of big dogs, and a traveler to warm places. And we can talk about that after <laughs> if you have any questions. Um, so my law firm is, oops, sorry, this, there we go. Just a quick note on that. So Immigration General Counsel is a law firm that I formed with a partner of mine. We're based in Torrance, but serve clients all over the country and all over the world, really. Um, so what we're gonna talk a little bit about today is going the wrong way. Here we go. All right. Um, the reason we, we thought this topic was relevant, um, and hopefully you'll find it to be so, is um, really to talk about what real estate agents need to know about immigration. And then the question is, you know, why do real estate agents need to know anything about immigration? And the answer is that truly sometimes it can make or break your sale. Um, I'll share a quick story um, before we get into the, the meaty part, the educational part of the session. Um, and that story is of a, a colleague of mine who is a real estate agent. Um, she was the seller in this particular transaction and she reached out to me and said, you know, I need your help. I have the sale that's coming through and all of a sudden it looks like the buyers are going to back out because they realized that immigration is not as simple as they originally thought. They came to the US on a tourist visa, were spending a summer here as a family, really loved it and you know, had sort of been exploring the option of, of relocating their family to the US. And, and then that emotional part happened, right? They saw a home and they loved it. They were like, oh, this is it. You know? And I'm sure you all know, everybody buys homes based on emotion when it's your personal home, I did. Um, so this family really thought, well, you know, now we can actually see ourselves living here and that's what we're gonna do. And, in, and until you know, a few weeks before closing, they realized, oh wait, like, what do we need to do in order to actually stay here? Immigration can, when immigration works, it works beautifully, but when there is an obstacle or there is sort of a, a curveball, it really can derail things. And this colleague of mine, a real estate agent, was you know, thoughtful enough to reach out and say, can you just talk with them and see what the option is? Because I'd hate to lose this sale. It was a $2 million sale and it came, came together very quickly. And she thought, look, if there's an option, I want them at least to know about it. If they back out, they back out and there's nothing you can do about it. But so the buyer's agent and the buyers got together with me and we explored their options. And, and, and this was a happy ending story because this family actually had a lot of options. They had substantial um, liquid assets, and also they had a business in their home country that allowed them to really facilitate an immigration um, benefit based on business. So it worked out. It doesn't always work out like that, but I'm hopeful that by having a quick introduction to various immigration programs today, you'll be able to pick up on something like this and Hopefully, it'll help you save a sale down the line or help your buyers realize their, their purchase um, of, their, of their dream home. So, so we'll talk a little bit about investor visas. We'll talk about employment-based green cards and business and professional visas, family-based immigration that I think almost everyone is really uh, familiar with, and, and really talk about it from a perspective of like how this might come into contact with, with your work. Um, so the key question here, here that I get from a lot of people is, you know, what is the investment immigration? I didn't know there was investment immigration. Um, and, you know, truly, it is a very small part of our immigration program. But the idea is that our government and our immigration programs want to encourage investments in this country. And as part of that encouragement incentive, if you will, they are providing immigration benefits. But the idea is that we are looking for, we as in the US government, is looking for foreign nationals who want to make investments in US businesses that are going to create jobs. That's really the hook for, for, for the government. Like why would the US government provide an investment-based program? They're not selling green cards. If you hear that on the street, it's not true. Um, but the idea is that 
make an investment in a for-profit business, you know, economic activity that's going to make a contribution to the U.S. economy through increased economic operations, through taxes, through job creation. That's really what the purpose of this is. But what this really means is that it creates opportunities for foreign nationals who are interested in living in the United States and running businesses in the United States. They can run their own business. They can be sort of a passive investor and they can also set up subsidiaries of companies they may have abroad in order to facilitate import export or simply have a branch in the US and do sales and marketing here and so on and so forth. Um, the most common of these programs is called EB-5. There's also a program called E-1 or E-2, and then there's also a program called L-1. And immigration in general is sort of like alphabet soup. So whenever you hear people talk about immigration, we're always throwing out these acronyms. It's just how it is. Um, so EB-5 is probably a program that is most familiar. How many of you have heard about it? Okay, so about a third of you. Okay, so EB-5 is a residence program, green card. Let me see, actually, that's my, um, sorry, I'm going to go back there. Oh, got to pay attention to my, <laughs> got to pay attention to my clicker here. Okay, so EB-5 program really gives an opportunity to foreign nationals who have approximately a million dollars in liquid asset to make an investment in a U.S. business. They can make it uh, somewhat passively into what generally ends up being a real estate development, or they can actually invest in a business that they will own directly and they will manage directly. So they can run the business themselves and the business has to create 10 jobs. That's the most important thing about EB-5, that it requires a creation of 10 full-time positions for US workers. The other aspect of EB-5 that's really important is that the money has to be sourced very carefully to a lawful origin. That's not to say that most money is not, doesn't come from a lawful source, but the important part is that it has to be documented. So it's not enough to say, you know what, I sold real estate in Hong Kong and that's where I got the money from. Great, we need to see the sales transactions, we need to see the bank statements. We really have to demonstrate this to a great degree of detail to the US government. It's just what they require. But it is a great program that works very well for individuals that are either looking for more of a passive investment or they want to do their own, pro, um, their own business in the U.S., regardless of whether or not they have a business in their home country. In EB-5 investment, which currently is, like I said, $800,000 minimum, but roughly speaking, you're looking at about a million dollars to when it's all said and done. That gets a green card to the investor, their spouse, and all the children are under the age of 21. So it's a single investment, covers the entire family. Um, we'll talk about the other two programs in a little bit. So I, I want to touch quickly on business immigration. So business immigration typically involves employment sponsorship. So when a U.S. company wants to hire a person who is a foreign national, for a specific job in the US. So that company needs to sponsor the employee. That's the most, um, most common way that we see um, business immigration come into play. And there's a visa called H-1B that I suspect most of you have heard of. It's the work visa, it's the classic visa for professionals, especially young people that come to the US and attend uh, undergrad or graduate programs in the US. That's kind of their path, right? They come here for school, the next thing to do is to get a work sponsorship through the H-1B program. And then if everything goes well, then you transition into a green card through that same employer. One thing to note there is that if you happen to be from India or China, the wait for that realization of a green card is extremely long. Um, 10, 20 years in some cases, I mean, it's very long. Yes, I know that's like the very sad part of immigration, very slow very slow. Um, the L, I mean, there's, again, the alphabet soup. There's also visas, L, L visas I mentioned. There are visas that are called O, P, and R. All of these are basically very specific immigration programs that target um, individuals or professionals in particular categories. 
I would say to take, a, take away from this is that, you know, if somebody has a bachelor's degree, there's a good chance that there's some sort of immigration program that can help them and you can help them explore it if, if they need to. Um, there are, can I mentioned on my slide here, there is a category for genius visas. So if individuals that are extremely well accomplished in what they do, have international awards, um, have patents, have, you know, have done really extraordinary things when it comes to their job, they might be able to get ahead of the line, ahead of everybody essentially, and participate in the EB1 or an O1 program that gives them an opportunity to sponsor themselves based on their accomplishments. Few people qualify for that, just, just to be clear. Um, Okay, so as it comes to real estate, again, EB-5 program, E-2 entrepreneur program, and the changes of status. This change of status is really referring to somebody who is in United States and how they can change their immigration status. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, one thing, again, to going back to the EB-5 program, um, 800,000 is the minimum investment right now. That changed last year. It used to be 500, but now it's 800. The standard investment it's, is million fifty, and this um, a common misconception about this particular point, the investment amount is a regional center or a passive EB five investment qualifies for the reduced investment versus direct. Your own business requires a million fifty, and that is a misconception, and it is not the case. What determines the level of investment? is the geographic location of the business. The government has an incentive, yet again, for business investments into what they consider to be special areas, which currently are three or two areas and one type of project. So areas that have high unemployment, usually in EB-5 lingo, they're called targeted employment areas. If your business that is receiving the investment is in that particular area, targeted employment area, then the investment is 800,000. If the business is in a rural area, the investment is 800,000. And if the investment is in an infrastructure project, infrastructure as in roads, bridges, electrical grid, things like that, then it's $800,000. Every other aspect of investment or every other um, type of investment and every other geographic location is going to be $1,050,000. Lawful source of funds is, is the other thing, as I mentioned, really important, absolutely essential. Um, sometimes what happens is that individuals will leave their country of origin, be ready to make the investment. They already pull the funds out. Sometimes we can't go back. It's really hard to trace the funds that may have been transferred through potentially untraceable sources. Uh, as we all know, a lot of countries, uh, namely India and China, have currency controls and individuals can only take a certain amount of money every year into foreign currency. Um, there are workarounds with all of, for all of these scenarios, but they have to be carefully planned for. So the earlier that you know, individuals can get counsel, the, the better it is. Um, again, 10, 10 jobs and then the regional centers and direct investments. Like I said, the way the best way to think of it is like a little bit of a passive investment is the regional center route. Direct investment, you run your own business in your own company. Um, okay, so three-step process for EB-5. This is something that is also really important to know. EB-5 is not one of those one and done kind of situations. It's a pretty lengthy process that individuals have to go through. Currently, um, Okay, how many of you think that getting a green card through EB-5 takes two years or less? Okay, maybe one, maybe a couple of people, two years or less. Okay, five years or less. Okay, all right, 10 years or more. Yeah, so, so it, depending on where you're from, if you happen to be from mainland China, you're looking at 10 years or more with one really important exception that we're gonna talk about in a minute. If you are from India or Vietnam, it's about five years. And if you are from the rest of the world, it's, it's less than five years. So we only have a number of visas that are allocated to EB-5 every year. And depending on the demand from particular countries, it creates a backlog. China, mainland China in particular, has been traditionally a very high demand 
place for EB5 visas. So they have a backlog. It's tough. It's really tough, but it, it is what it is. Um, again, there's a really important exception that's, that comes into play that we're going to talk a little bit about in a minute. Um, in terms of the E2 visa, I want to say a couple. Oh, <laughs> here we go. Um, I think I clicked too many times initially. Yeah, it was, here we go. Okay. Um, so this is a really important news for the EB-5 program and really relevant to, to all, of, all of the work that you do. Um, the EB-5 program has a new, new laws on the books as of last, about a year ago, actually, March 2022. And this new law um, has made the possibility of what's called a concurrent filing. What that means is that a person who is pursuing an EB-5 investment and happens to be in the United States in lawful temporary status, they're able to apply for their green card at the same time. It used to be completely differently, right? You used to have to file the EB-5 petition, make the investment, file the EB-5 petition, wait for immigration to approve it, wait for your visa to become available, and then you can apply for a green card. What concurrent filing does is that allows individuals to file for a green card at the same time which means that they can stay in the United States and wait for all these processes to, to work themselves out, right? Immigration is still going to take two to three years to adjudicate that first petition, but the difference is that you can be here. The investor can be in the United States in lawful status. Their children can go to school, public school, any school they want to. They can run their own business. So direct TB5 really wasn't a possibility for most people that are from India, China, or Vietnam, because they couldn't come here to really manage their business. They couldn't be here to see that business function and, and operate. With the concurrent filing, they can do that. So the requirements for this is that um, a person has to be in the United States in lawful status. Typically, what we see is tourist status, B1, B2 visa. We also see F1 student status. So individuals that come for school, but then they decide to file for a green card through EB-5 investment. So they have to be in lawful status. They have to file their EB-5 petition and residence application at the same time before their status ends. And this is that process called change of status that I was mentioning earlier. So they're changing from their visitor or, tour, or tourist visitor or business visitor or student status to residents. Big caveat is that they are essentially grounded in the US for about 12 months until immigration gives them a permission for international travel. So that I think is probably one of the biggest wrinkles in this whole scheme is that a lot of individuals that have businesses abroad cannot be grounded in the US for 12 months. A lot of families are making it work by splitting up, you know, one spouse applies and stays here with the children, the other spouse doesn't, they go back and forth. When the EB-5 is approved, they can follow to join. There is ways around it, but it's really important to know that a person can do this right now. They can change from the tourist uh, visitor status to green card pending, but they have to be willing to stay for a while. If a person leaves without permission from the United States government, their residence application is abandoned. Really not an ideal scenario. I mean, not the end of the world, but you know, preferably don't do that. Um, and this, you know, this is a really kind of a hot topic right now, um, and it, it is becoming very relevant to, um, I guess I'd say to real estate agents for sure, um, but also a lot of the students that are deciding like, look, I don't want to go back. I, I, my plan was not to go back anyway, and now I have this option. Maybe my, my parents can gift me the money. I can stay here, file for an EB-5 petition and not have to go back. And Filing for residence give, gives individuals an opportunity to work anywhere they want to work. And once they get that travel document approved, then they can travel internationally back and forth, no problem. And they can wait out the entire process here. So truly, I think that was um, 
a concession that our government made uh, as forgiveness for all the extremely long processing times that they've that we're having to put up with. So um, that more about the yeah, you have to file it before before the individual status ends. Um, and okay, so let me touch quickly on the E2 entrepreneur visa. This is not a residence program. The E2 visa is a temporary visa that is based on an investment in a US business. Great thing about it is that it can last for a lifetime. There is no numerical cap on how many years a person can have an E2 visa status. The deciding criteria is that as long as your business is operating and contributing to the US economy, you can continue to renew the status and have the status, right? Um, it is definitely considered one of the privileged visa categories. And, and what that means in reality is that not every country is a participating um, E2 treaty country. Notably, um, it does include Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, Mexico, Colombia, and all of the European countries more or less. Um, and that's where we see most of these investments come from is these certain Asian countries, Central and Latin America, and then the European countries. It does not, in, it does not include the countries that we have greatest immigration from, which is China, Vietnam, India, Russia, Brazil. Um, again, um, it is an option for a person who owns a passport from one of these countries. So say a person is born in China, but they have since acquired South Korean citizenship. They are qualified. The country of birth does not co govern. It is the passport that you currently carry. If a person is um, a Chinese national, mainland China national, is married to a South Korean person, they both parties, both spouses can get status as long as the South Korean national spouse is the principal applicant. So not everybody in a family has to have the same passport. It is possible to transfer the benefit um, as long as the principal applicant is on the trade list of countries. Um, the other great thing about E2 visa is it does not have um, an investment amount that's set by the law. The law basically says that you need to invest a substantial capital in practice, what that means, you have to fund the business with enough money to operate it, right? It has to launch the business. It has to be enough to get its operations off the ground. And we demonstrate that through the business plan, through you know whatever it is the, the first year expenditures would be. Um, it is also a very um, easy to process type of visa. I mean, we've done E2 visas um, within a span of say four weeks which is, you know, I'm like it's speed of lightning when it comes to immigration, um, but it's doable. It can be done in the US as a, as a change of status if somebody's already here, or they can do it through their consulate, one step processing, meaning that the individual goes directly to the consulate with their application, has an interview, does not have to deal with immigration at all. Same criteria, spouse and investor and their children under 21 can all receive the E2 status. It is a, a status that gives a, a, the ability to go to school. Children can go to school. Spouses can also work anywhere in the US they want to work. So really a privileged visa category um, available to about 90 countries um, around the world. Um, I think we've covered all of that. Um, Oh, another thing about E2 visas is it can be a partnership with a US person as well. It does not have to be 100% owned by a foreign national. So if any of you have a business idea and you really wanna have somebody you know, front some of the capital for it, this is an option. Uh, you can be the sort of the US, uh, US side of the operation and they can be the, the capital infusing party. It works, works pretty well. Um, the change of status, again, like I said, it is an option for most of these categories as long as the person is invalid status at the time of the filing? Great question. So it depends. The, the foreign national who is applying for the E2 visa has to be able to demonstrate control of the entity. And that can be negative control. What that means is that the foreign person and the US person can have 50-50 ownership. Or if you have more than two people, say like if you have three people, as long as we can demonstrate that there are sufficient, there's sufficient capital and shares of the company, as well as management rights that are given to the foreign national to give them the control, they can, they can demonstrate it. 
Um, immigration looks at the documents presented, right? So as long as the operating agreement or whatever business agreement we, we provide to them states that, look, this person has sufficient control, it, it works. Yeah, okay. Um, okay. Let's see, I think that is actually all that I needed to say about these various different programs. I know it was a lot of information and I think we have a couple of minutes for questions. If, if any of you do have questions, I'm happy to, to answer them right now. Yeah. Oh. oh, I don't know, let me clarify the procedure. Okay, Let, let's come up to the mic. Yeah, that's, that sounds good. <laughs> Hi, Belma. Thank you for a detailed uh, presentation. So if the E2 visa is so easy, how do you, why people will go to EB5 and how do you compare these two? Yeah, great question. Um, the key difference in terms of comparison is that the E2 visa is not residence. So it is a non-immigrant status, temporary status that a person can renew for the rest of their life as long as their business is operating. So that means a couple of things. You have to go back to immigration every so often, right? And sometimes individuals are just tired of that, right? Like, I don't want to have to keep giving the information about my business, sharing my taxes, you know, really being good about paper trail and all of that, which if you're going to do immigration, you kind of have to do that. That's just part of the game, right? And then the other part of it, too, is that once your kids reach age 21, they're no longer able to derive status from you. So a lot of our clients start with an E2 they do that for five and six years or even sometimes 10 years. And then it's sort of the, the children are getting into the high school age. And then they're thinking, I got to figure something out because you know what? The kids are telling me they're not going back. At that point, the kids have already lived in the U.S. for 10, 15 years. They don't feel like their, their home country is really their country anymore. So the family then has to begin looking into residence options. So that's I would say the number one criteria, it, it's giving the children the status through the parents. And then some clients of ours, like I said, just want to just tire of immigration and tire of having to having to pay me every couple of years to, to do their investment uh, extension and so on and so forth. So those are the two the two key reasons. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Good morning. Thank Good you morning. for being here. Um, my question is, if a holder of a green card uh, is a resident here and also a citizen of another country, mm -hmm. how do they uh, deal with the personal income tax? Very good question. Um, and let me begin by saying I'm not a tax attorney. I'm not a tax advisor. So for anything tax related, you do have to speak with a professional. But I will tell you that as a green card holder, as a resident, regardless of how a person comes to that status, the U.S. law requires that uh, resident income taxes be filed. Also, everyone in the U.S. who is a resident or a citizen is subject to global taxation. And what that really means is that you have to declare your global income. It doesn't mean that you have to pay tax on your global income in the United States necessarily. A lot of the countries have tax treaties with the United States. As long as you can demonstrate that you have met the treaty requirements, you have paid tax somewhere, then that's sufficient. But you are required to declare taxes on your global income. Um, there are very skilled international CPAs who help individuals structure their assets and, um, and their income essentially so that they could put tax, potentially minimize the liability, but it, it is a requirement. And how hard is it for um, an area to be determined as a TEA um, zone, yeah. I guess? So the, the law says it has to be 150% of unemployment, national unemployment. Currently, we're at about 5-ish percent for national unemployment. So anything that's 8.5% or more qualifies. We also have the option of... Um, essentially joining geographic areas to demonstrate an average unemployment in the area and therefore qualify based on that. So, you know, brief answer, Jolene, it's not that hard. Um, much of Los Angeles County can qualify. Certainly a lot of the state of California qualifies. Okay. And um, from your cases or experiences, has um, a certain county or area been uh, successfully established as, as a TA zone? 
Yeah, there have been many. I mean, especially if we're talking like a little bit further east from us, like Kern County, uh, Imperial, certain parts of Imperial County and so on and so forth. But what we mostly see, though, is not necessarily looking at the county level, not even looking at the city level. We look at the census tract itself. So it's actually pretty granular. Um, and, you know, if a business is located in a census tract that qualifies, even if the entire city does not qualify, you could still still qualify. Hi, Velma. Nice. Actually, I have several uh, questions on the chat okay, on Zoom. Perfect, perfect. Uh, one is um, Aslam status for concurrent filing. Would those people already in the U.S. be allowed to submit EB-5 application? As, as long as they are currently in lawful non-immigrant status. What Typically, what that means is that they have either student status, tourist status that has not expired, or they have maybe an H-1B visa or an L-1 visa through their employee. So as long as they have status, ad adjustment to residence is possible. So someone who is in the United States without a status is not able to change status or adjust to residence. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Even if EB-5 visa category, it's not uh, current, the applicant can still file. I think you kind of answered that question. Mm -hmm. Adjustment of status concurrently if the applicant is in the U.S., correct? So as of as of right now, there are aspects of EB-5. They're probably looking at you know specific uh, categories for China. There are new categories under the, the new law that are current for everybody, including Chinese nationals. A person who filed an EB-5 petition uh, prior to 2022 March is probably not going to be able to file for adjustment of status now. The new law only applies to new filings, right? So if a person is from mainland China and they filed their EB-5 prior to March 2022, they are not able to take advantage of concurrent filing now. But anybody who is from mainland China and they, they file under the TEA or the high unemployment rural area or infrastructure project they can file for adjustment uh, at the same time. One more. Um, for EB-5, which has a travel control outside the U.S. for an emergency travel, how long can they return to the U.S.? Thank you. Um, emergency travel document or emergency parole is what it's called, um, can be issued um, truly based on emergency cases, kind of like life and death situation most of the time, and they are issued for up to 30 days. So a person would be allowed to leave the US for only up to 30 days and then they have to return. Um, in some countries, there are people that don't have a family name and like, so their passport says family name unknown. FNU, yeah. Is, like how, how, how do they go about that when they come here? Do they have to, do they just come up with a name uh, or like, what do they what do they do to yeah. fix that so that they can have first and last? Um, so you'd be surprised. There are a lot of passports that literally say FNU, um, Mary FNU, or you know anything like that. Um, it it can be like that. I mean, there's really no. Uh, what we want to look for is consistency, right? And then sometimes you could. When you, when you get a green card, you could say that you want to have a different name, right? And you when you become a citizen, you have the option of going through the court process to change your name and things like that. Um, there, you know, not having a name in a certain country is not going to prevent you from applying for immigration. As long as we look at, we, we just look at documents for consistency. Sometimes we take affidavits from individuals in that home country. If a person doesn't have a birth certificate, same situation. There are a lot of countries that did not issue birth certificates prior to 1970, for example. Um, that doesn't mean that you don't qualify to, for immigration. It just means that there are alternative sources of documents that we can utilize to, to proceed. But I mean, but it, it, if they need to have a last name or I guess, do they do they need to have a last name here? And what if what if they really what if they want to have a last name to be, you know, to, to be proper in the U.S.? Yeah, like, I mean, just... you would you would literally there is a there is a way to explain that on immigration documents to say that this is what my birth certificate says. This is they have to have a passport, right? This is what my passport says. I I'd like you can follow the process to change that, right? It's it's not. I don't think there's a law that says you have to have a last name, but I could be wrong on that. <laughs> um, I don't I don't know to be honest with you. As long as long as we can demonstrate that th this is your identity, that's really what the government needs to know. Yeah. 
Okay. Yes. You're very welcome. Thank you, so right. much, Salma, for such an informative talk and presentation. And on behalf of WSGVR, we would like to give you a little token. Thank you. Appreciation. Thank you so much. <laughs> Oh, my gift. <laughs> Julie, step off the chair. Awesome. Okay, so um, next we're having our attendance drawings. All WSGVR members are included in attendance drawings. Not all can be displayed, but all are included. Pot is at $250 today. If we do not get a winner, $25 get added to the pot each week until we have a winner. If we get a winner, pot will begin again at $25. If for our last breakfast meeting of the year, we still don't have a winner. We will draw names until we get a winner. Winners must be present um, at the association to win. When your name is called, you must announce that you are present. If you call your name three times and you do not respond, we will move on. So let's do the spin. It's Yin Burr. Congratulations, Yin. Wow, $250. $250. Woohoo! Congratulations. <laughs> and next we have our Amazon gift card drawing. Uh, we'll select three winners from the um, people who are attending today. We'll receive a $25 gift, Amazon gift card. Is that for the Tumblr? So please make sure all your business cards are in the Tumblr. We got um, Kimberly Shea. Oh, congratulations, Kimberly. Please come up for your prize. Uh, Jeffrey. Um, Arabic, Jeffrey Arabic, don't be shy, come on up, <laughs> yay, and we have Nancy Chang, from Happy Home Realty, Nancy Chang from Happy Home, wait, wait, hold on, sorry, it's, it's, okay, it's the other Nancy, from Happy Home Realty, thank you so much, congratulations. And then please make sure to participate in our education classes. A list of upcoming classes are displayed on your screen. And um, so we have um, the commercial seminar that's coming up Tuesday, March 14th from 1230 to one. The virtual training from Wednesday, uh, March 15th from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. The meet and learn what's home warranty and what items are covered and not covered. That is available Tuesday, March 21st at, from 11 o'clock to 12. And foundations for success in commercial real estate. Well, that's an interesting one. Tuesday, March 28th, um, 8.30 to 5.30 p.m. Um, so please do uh, join us for those informative classes. And um, next is our 50-50 raffle. Everybody have your raffle tickets ready and I have the money in hand. It is $63 today. And the lucky winner is 3722299. Oh yay, we have a winner. It is $63. So before we end our meeting, uh, if there's anyone who would like to pitch a listing who didn't register previously can come up front with their flyer. Any pitches? Okay, so please join us next week on uh, March 16th. Our speaker is going to be Thomas Wong of Monterey Park, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, everyone, for joining us um, today, and our meeting is adjourned. Thank you.